Just Penguin right. 2015, an introduction to Docker. <laughs> Indeed, introduction to Docker. Uh, so let's see. It's like 5.02 right now, so I think I'm going to give the stragglers like a couple minutes to come in and then get started. So how's everybody really doing? We're good. We're here. Excited about PenguinCon? I forgot how much I like PenguinCon until I was like actually here because I flew in from San Francisco. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really great to be here again. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan LeClaire, and I work for a startup in San Francisco called Docker. Um, and so some of you might have heard it, uh, heard about it around on the interwebs uh, or in real life from people that you know. Um, so there's like this insane amount of sort of stuff that people are talking about in the field. Uh, and it can be like super overwhelming. Um, and you may have heard things where you're like, I don't know, maybe it sounds too good to be true, or it's like, I don't know who I can believe, and that kind of thing. So um, my goal uh, at this talk is to really just um, kind of set you up with a lot of the sort of history and 101 stuff about Linux containers and about Docker. And uh, I hope that you enjoy it, and we're doing a little bit of, um, that I think, so we should leave the door slightly ajar so that people can get in. Maybe you get like a little stick or something and put it in there. So he said basically we move the lock and close it all the way, so we should just make sure that it's like slightly open. Um, cool. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. I this is my third PinguaCon, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, and I love PinguaCon. It's one of my favorite events, so I'm super, super happy and excited to be presenting. And I really appreciate all of you guys uh, coming and um, listening to me blabber on and on and on about Docker for an hour. Um, so, uh, so the way I kind of want to get started, um, just talking about this subject with you, um, is firstly. Uh, well, okay, so who here has heard of Docker? Might have a couple just random walk-ins. Okay, so that's a decent amount of hands. Uh, how about used it? Uh, okay, great. Um, so, uh, anybody use it like for their job or in production? Wow, none, awesome. Okay, I get to convert a bunch of people. So, uh, so, Okay, great, then you don't come in with sort of a tainted view of things. <laughs> uh, or bias, I don't know. Um, so, uh, so, anything you might have heard, firstly, I want to just start the talk off by just saying, let's sort of put all that aside. You might have heard like, oh, containers versus virtual machines or something like that. And so, you know, to start the talk off, I want you to just sort of take all the things that people are talking about, um, and there's just, there's so much noise and bullshit in the community and in the ecosystem that I really want you guys to kind of just put all that aside, and we're going to just go right back to basics and talk about things from sort of a technical <coughs> point of view, um, and then, you know, probably more towards the end of the talk, I'm going to be talking about some sort of more futuristic stuff that we're working on that I'm really excited about and a lot of other people are too. So, uh, so to start off, let's get in our time machine here and we're going to go back to the year 2005. Um, and so in the year 2005 there was a little company that you might have heard of called Google um, that was starting to really make headway into this totally brand new field of stuff that people hadn't really done before, which is warehouse scale computing, uh, right? So, um, you know, Google uh, basically um, wanted to provide a service that was up um, with many, many nines, so 99.99999% of the time. Uh, it's actually really funny 
there was a Google outage like yesterday or two days ago and everyone on the internet was just like freaking out. <laughs> like Google was down for five minutes and all of the associated services uh, and uh, I saw all sorts of noise online of like I went to go Google, is Google down, and realized I had no idea how to figure it out without Google. <laughs> and then everyone was like, no, we have to use Bing. Uh, so, or they just, on principle, wouldn't do that even. So, um, uh, anyways, the point is that Google has really uh, complex infrastructure needs, and they're doing computing at the warehouse level. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking these whole giant warehouses full of servers, so full of computers, and um, trying to treat it like it's one big computer. Uh, and so it's a really cool idea, but there's a lot of problems, right? Uh, so in the real world, um, I'm not really sure how many of you have maybe uh, worked in a data center or, or been involved with one. I personally haven't, but I've heard a lot about it. Um, you know. Failure is extremely common, uh, so that's a really big problem. You have machines go down, or like a screw comes loose in the rack and the hard drive goes spinning across the floor. Uh, and um, you know, failure happens all the time, so like little things that might have happened like 0.01% of the time suddenly become really significant when you're operating across 10,000 machines. Um, and not only that, uh, you want to bring as much resource utilization out of those machines that you're investing in as possible, right? So um, this is a big reason why when virtualization hit in the first place, um, because we were now suddenly able to actually have better isolation, uh, run multiple apps, so more things on one machine, uh, it's really significant. Come on in, that's okay if you want to come in. Or just leave, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, and you can come in if you want. Alright, okay. Uh, so Hi, just checking the door because I got a complaint about the lock. Oh yeah, it just it locks if it shuts. You know, it's kind of easy to shut. So I'll um I'll put some tape on this if you don't mind. Oh yeah. No, no problem. Go for it. Um, so so uh, so you have a couple of, of options really. Um, if you wanted to robustly manage your infrastructure in that kind of situation. Um, and the thing that most people were sort of falling back on at the time was virtualization. Um, so in case you're not familiar, virtualization, as I'm referring to it, uh, is sort of emulating the hardware to actually run an operating system inside of software. Um, so companies like VMware and then other open source projects like KVM uh, what they're actually doing is sort of similar to what an emulator does, for instance, uh, if you play Game Boy games on your computer. It's actually simulating the little moving parts that make it go. Uh, and so you can actually emulate a physical hardware device inside of the computer. Um, and so that works great for most companies, but in Google's case, it's basically just too damn expensive. Um, so, you know, you have all these machines, you could virtualize, but you're basically throwing out all of this memory and CPU that's going into that isolation. And you're running all of these different kernels, which are the same, uh, and eating up so much memory and CPU that it becomes very frustrating to do at that kind of scale. Um, so what Google did was basically they said, look, all we're doing is we're running these Linux processes, right, so we're running Linux on commodity hardware. And we need a better way to isolate off Linux processes. And then we also need a way to sort of control their resource usage, right? So um, one of the things that they needed to be able to do was basically take a process and say, I want to set it so that this process only ever uses eight shares of the CPU relative to another process's eight shares of the CPU relative to blah, 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 and so on, so that they could divvy up the resources in a very fine-grained way. So it's very important to have that kind of control over what you're actually working with. Um, so they did what any sensible open source uh, citizen would do, and they started contributing the things that they wanted back to the kernel. Um, so the end result of this was that uh, two new features got added to the Linux kernel, one of which is C groups, or control groups. And what that is, is it's a way of isolate, uh, grouping your processes uh, so that you can control the resources that they use in a very fine-grained way. 
Uh, you can basically take a process and say things like, if this process exceeds 512 megabytes of memory usage, just kill it. Um, don't let it keep going out of control. And so this was really helpful in solving the noisy neighbor problem, if you were familiar with that. Uh, the basic idea of that is that you know, if you're running two different things on the same box, um, one of them might suddenly hit some unforeseen code path, spiral out of control, and now suddenly, instead of just one app going down, all of the things that are co-located are messing with each other. Um, and this is a really bad problem, even for cloud providers like Amazon, who, you know, you might spin up a, a virtual machine on Amazon that's ostensibly the same size as another virtual machine, but uh, in actuality, you're getting slightly different things every time. And so what you end up with is, in Amazon's case, you end up with things like Netflix gaming the system by spinning up five VMs that purport to be the same thing but actually aren't, choosing the best one, and then just dumping the rest. Uh, so it worked great for Netflix because they uh, are the ones that get the good VMs, but now everybody else gets the VMs that get dumped that don't have resource usage that's as good. Um, so, you know, coming back to our Google use case, uh, you know, it might be something like, for instance, uh, you want to be able to run a big MapReduce job. Um, in case you're not familiar, MapReduce is the thing that they use to actually do the crunching of these, like, giant, massive stores of data that they have. Um, you want to be able to run a MapReduce job on the same computers and hardware that you're running uh, your like Gmail server on, right? So Gmail is just a computer program that runs on the same hardware as everything else that Google does. Um, and, you know, to be honest, like, the MapReduce job can wait, right? There's no reason why if that MapReduce job wants to eat up a bunch of resources, it should steal those resources away from Gmail. Gmail is really critical. And, like, crunching that data can wait, so it doesn't make a difference if that data is crunched in two days or in three days. We don't really care. We just want it to be done at some point. Uh, but Gmail, if Gmail suddenly starts going down because something else that we're doing over here spirals out of control and uses a bunch of resources, um, that's really bad because now suddenly we have a bunch of pissed off, confused people calling us up saying, why is Gmail down? Um, so, so resource usage to control the next neighbor problem was the reason for C groups. And so you can use it to control things like block IO. So how fast you're actually reading and writing the disk. Um, CPU, uh, memory, and um, then there is a, a second bit, uh, and that second bit was kernel namespaces. So um, in order to provide greater isolation at the process level, they actually created this primitive in the Linux kernel that's called namespaces, and so you can actually have your own network namespace and mount namespace and inter-process communication namespace that's totally separate from anything else on the system. Um, so it's really interesting because these two primitives combine together to become Linux containers, right? So there's no one thing that you can point at in the kernel and say, that's the container. Like, there's no direct primitive. It's a, a higher order thing that's sort of this abstraction that people build up. Um, and uh, so there's no actual thing in the kernel that you can point to and say it's containers. When people talk about containers, they mostly mean uh, you know, a process that's running using these properties that we've spec'd out in the namespaces and the C groups, um, and it's isolated off. So for instance, if it's on, in its own little network namespace, it has its own local host, and it can't actually interfere with any of the sort of network things that other processes are doing. Um, so this really helps to mitigate a lot of problems, and it was very successful for Google, um, especially because uh, they wrote all of this sort of tooling around it to help manage that, and they created a system known as Borg, uh, which is their sort of thing that takes all of that homogenous compute resourcing and turns it into basically one giant computer that you can run containers on. Um, and they just released actually a really interesting paper. If you're curious about the subject at all, I highly recommend you check out the board paper. Um, it talks about all of their real infrastructure that they're using to do things and actually do things like, A, run these long batch processing jobs side by side with actual critical production services. 
um, and also what are the kinds of things that they're doing so that like if something goes wacky and we have to take down one thing, we can spin it back up in another place. Um, you know, or let's say something catastrophic happens, like a whole rack fails because uh, somebody like tripped over a power cable and accidentally unplugged it. Right? It sounds kind of silly, but those sort of things that you don't anticipate really do happen. Um, so you, when you're running a big distributed system, you have to account for that kind of failure and, and basically say, all right, well, you may not be able to recover from like everything, right? So um, if uh, a thunderstorm hit and knocked out all the power in the data center, then we probably can't recover from that, because how would you? Um, but we can recover from those little mundane, everyday kind of failures that you know, honestly, uh, like tend to really just plague uh, developers and, and operations teams. Um, so, you know, I'm talking about things like uh, suddenly your database has a memory leak and you don't catch it because your alerts are off or something, and boom, everything goes down. <laughs> and you have to power cycle the DB and all that kind of stuff. Well, it would be great if that could just be done automatically, and, and that's what Borg is, partially. Um, so, anyways. Uh, Google started contributing these features, and um, if you fast forward a few years, uh, a couple of people started building sort of more higher order things around it to make it a little bit easier and more approachable to use. Um, and one of those technologies was this thing called LXC, uh, which is short for Linux containers. Um, LXC was a Red Hat project, um, and uh, basically it just uh, kind of takes some of those you know, really low level kernel features and makes them a little bit easier to use. Um, so, uh, fast forwarding to about 2009, uh, there was this company running a platform as a service, uh, sort of like Heroku, if you're familiar with what that is. Uh, essentially, the idea is you define in a, a little file, how do I run my app, like what are the pieces and components that actually make it up. And then you do a, a push from source control, so you do like a git push out to a remote that they control, and they'll actually run and host your app for you. Um, and it works, uh, you know, it's a pretty good model. Um, well, it's really pricey. That's, I think, one of the main things that people sort of don't like about it. And also, it's inflexible. Uh, so, you know, it's really hard to get custom dependencies, like I need image magic for my application to work. Um, and, anyways. So there was this company uh, called Dot Cloud, uh, which was originally from Paris, France, uh, that, um, well, they were doing a very similar thing. Uh, actually, their original spin was that they were the platform as a service for multiple language stacks, right? So originally, there was like the PHP PaaS, which was like just for your PHP app, uh, the Ruby PaaS, which was Heroku, just for running your Ruby on Rails apps. Um, and there were a couple sort of things just for one stack. Um, and Doc Cloud came along and, and basically their goal was to become that for all the different stacks that you might want um, and you know, sort of pioneer that for modern application development. Uh, and, and the way that all of these platform as a service providers do this little trick, by the way, is they all use Linux containers, basically. There's probably a couple of them that might have weird custom setups, but uh, in order to actually squeeze that many people's applications onto you know, a limited amount of hardware and, and make it worthwhile uh, in terms of cost, you have to actually wring as much utilization out of your infrastructure as possible. Uh, so it's not really easy to do with traditional virtualization. Uh, it's much easier to do with uh, containers. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, so Dot Cloud did this for several years, and they always sort of tinkered with the idea of open sourcing the Linux container engine that powered the platform as a service, but they didn't want to, um, mostly because it was so tightly coupled to their infrastructure that it just wouldn't have been useful for anyone else. Um, so if you've ever worked on a system which turns into a big ball of mud that people just keep slapping stuff onto and slapping more stuff onto, and then before you know it, it's this big beast that no one knows every little dark corner of, and you know, if management comes to you and says, hey, you know, it'd be really great if we could just break off a little piece and this other team could use it in their app and you just laugh and laugh and laugh because there's no way you could ever decouple that. Uh, that's sort of what the container engine was like for Dot Cloud. Um, and so uh, the company really wasn't really super hot in probably about, I, I guess about two or three years ago. Uh, and so uh, 
as one sort of last Hail Mary, they actually rewrote the container engine uh, in Go, which is a language that Google has actually created. Um, and uh, it was in Python before. And they sort of infamously demoed it at PyCon and it blew up on the internet and they open sourced this container engine. Uh, and now the whole company has pitted it to be Docker. Uh, and so uh, that is sort of the situation today. Um, and in my opinion, the real magic ingredient of Docker uh, is not necessarily that it provides you with container tech per se, but that it has this sort of nice, relatable, easy to use interface around all of these things that were really uh, hard to use and required you to be this like esoteric wizard or witch who actually knows the sort of invocations to make it go. Uh, and also knows a bunch about low-level kernel and networking stuff and all this sort of things that like, you know, your average everyday developer or ops person just really doesn't have time to learn. Um, and so, in my opinion, it just made container tech way more approachable and blew the doors wide off. Um, you know, just anybody and everybody sort of getting in the game of working with containers. Um, and so now these things that previously were only available to, to Google and big companies working at that scale now are sort of becoming available in a general sense to everybody else. Um, and there's still a lot of pieces of the puzzle to figure out and everybody's kind of um, still trying to figure out, all right, what's the best way to do things? Uh, there's definitely some things about Docker that we know we don't like, um, but you know, it's grown really fast and I think actually for how fast things have been moving, it's done a pretty good job about keeping up. Um, and in my opinion, it's really awesome technology and I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of go through a couple basic demo things with you now. Oh yeah, and so also uh, one interesting ingredient that Docker sort of threw in the mix uh, is that in addition to the sort of two basic things of so C groups and namespaces, uh, there is now also Docker introducing into the equation this idea that your container uh, should use a copy and write file system and a union file system, and uh, it should run in sort of like a little chroot-like environment. Um, so if you're familiar with chroot, it's kind of a way of isolating off uh, something at the directory level in Unix systems. And so um, when you run a container, it really looks like it's its own independent little Linux system uh, where the process that you start it with is actually PID1. Um, and so uh, it seems a little inane at first. You're like, why does this matter? Um, but then you sort of realize that it really enables this quantum leap of stuff that just wasn't really possible before. Um, for instance, uh, like if you have a big uh, test suite for your Ruby on Rails application uh, and it runs through just hundreds or thousands of unit tests and it takes a really, really long time to run, uh, and all of the tests kind of depend on like the database being in a clean state. Uh, so you know, before and after each little block of tests, you have to actually set the database up the way you want, run the tests, then rip the database back down again. Um, well, to do it with like to actually try and parallelize parallelize that with traditional virtualization would be per prohibitively expensive, basically, for your average everyday mom and pop shop. Um, but with containers, because they start up so quickly and um, because they let you just get at this clean environment really, really rapidly, you know, you kind of like start looking at problems like that and suddenly think, oh, that's a lot more approachable just because I can squeeze way more isolated processes onto the same hardware, whether it's virtual or not. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle. Um, so. I'm going to go ahead and do some demo. I don't really like slides because uh, I think they kind of rot your brain. Uh, but I want to take the rest of my talk and I'll just kind of show you around a little bit uh, with some Docker commands and, and talk about some things. Uh, and then ask some questions at the end since hopefully you guys are out there thinking the gears are turning and you're maybe uh, wondering about certain specific things because uh, there's just so much ground to cover and, and so many things that can go on and a lot of activity in the community. Um, and by the way, Docker is all open source and it always will be. There's never gonna be any kind of like open core thing where there's like special features available to businesses that aren't available to you, the end user. 
Um, there will be like a commercial edition that's just like meant to be stable, basically. Uh, so it's like, you know, basically like cut the release and then backport security fixes and other like really critical things so that the open source project can keep moving and innovating and, um, you know, we don't have to try and tell like a giant bank or business like, yeah, you know, this is fixed, just upgrade to the latest version. <laughs> yeah, they don't like that. Um, so, um, you know, you can go check it out and um, in case you're curious where you can go look at it, github.com slash docker slash docker is a really good starting point. Um, the readme has a lot of things that, um, you know, you might be curious about and the activity level on the GitHub repo is super insane. Um, by the way, just sort of tangentially, you know, Docker is mostly written in Go, um, and I think Go is a really, really cool language. Um, you should check it out if you're interested at all. Uh, really, really powerful, um, sort of inflexible as a feature, uh, and uh, the, one of the best things about it is just stupid, easy concurrency. You just say go function, and it just runs in the background, and then you communicate with your main thread using channels. Super cool. Um, so, like, you see that there's like 116 pull requests, and that's like that's crazy. So 7,015 closed, and this project's been around for like two years. So that's insane. Uh, so yeah, so the. the uh, uh, GitHub's a great place to start sort of taking in information about it. And um, if you actually want to run Docker, you need Linux somehow. So there's a sort of a variety of ways to install it and use it that I won't go into right now. Uh, but one of them is a project that I work on, and it's called Docker Machine. Um, so Machine is a project that lets you create VMs, whether they're local or in the cloud, um, to actually run Docker on. And so you can run containers in those machines. Uh, and like, so I'm gonna run some Docker commands right now, and you can you can see that uh, we're gonna run them against this uh, machine right here, which is called Overlay because it actually uses the Overlay file system for the sort of like little uh, ch root bits, and um, it's not actually a ch root happening behind the scenes. It's technically a thing called a pivot root, um, but I don't really know the super intimate details of how that happens. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, Docker is just this little program on the command line that you run uh, that has all these sort of like actions to it. Actually, I'm going to pop into a little team up session here. Uh, so like you can see when you run Docker, it just spits out this big wall of text that you have like all the different things that you can do with it. Um, but sort of the basic commands, and actually let me make sure my environment variables are set up the right way. So let's see. Uh, this command will actually set the environment variables to tell my Docker client where to connect to the right way. So I'm going to connect to a remote daemon. Um, there's two bits to Docker. One is a daemon that runs and has an, a REST API server, REST-ish, that you connect to remotely and actually tell it the commands to like run the containers. Um, so it's pretty cool because you can have like Docker sitting on a server somewhere or several servers and basically just run a bunch of commands using the local client or using anything that speaks Docker API. And the API will take those commands and be like, okay, I'll go do all the actual work of creating containers. Um, so there are Docker binary <coughs> clients that run on Mac and on Windows and that's what I'm using here. Um, Go has really awesome cross-compilation support. So. Uh, so the basic command to look at all of your containers is docker ps. So if you run docker ps, you'll see this sort of like little table formatted thing that shows you all the containers. And um, just because my text is really big, because I, can everybody see okay? Okay, cool. Um, just because I want to make sure everyone could see, I'm gonna just pipe the output of some of these commands into less, which will make it easier to read and not uh, weird looking. So you can see that there are these sort of like container headings and I don't have any containers around so you only see the headings of this little table like uh, output format here. And uh, if I do PS minus A, it will show me all the containers that I have around whether they're running or stopped. 
Uh, so I have two containers. Uh, one is a container that runs Debian, uh, the Jessian, uh, the Jesse release of Debian. And uh, one is a container that runs Elasticsearch. Uh, so these are these little containers that I have around. And um, if you want to actually create a new container, the command to do that is docker run. Um, and so I do <coughs> docker run uh, minus it, so i for interactive mode and t for give me a little pseudo teletype terminal. 